Alabama sketchbook. Seated Negro woman looking to the left. Drawing half-length image of a young Negro woman wearing a dress with an empire waistline and pearl earrings and necklace and holding a basket of flowers over her left arm. Painting the slaves escaping through the swamp. The slave watching her pursuers. Ground. Black woman walking in front of a board fence. Background, plantation house and outbuildings, slave quarters, in a grove of trees. Slave woman wearing a runaway collar with two children. Emaciated Negro man eating dead horse flesh. In the background, Negro man strapped to a ladder being lashed. Slave woman seen from the back. Her head in left profile, kneading bread and smoking a pipe, parrot thunder, negress carrying her young child, woman carrying baby, and negro boy running at left. Negro man at right being held by the collar. Two dogs wear collars. One labeled Cass, the other expounder. The negro revenged. Negro man on a precipice calling down nature's fury. On a slave ship, Negro woman seated. At right, slavers throwing overboard the dead and dying, typhoon coming. On manacled limbs of slaves among the waves, foreground, slave ship in the middle. Distance, a black woman kneeling in a storm, her hands clasped in prayer and her eyes cast upward. Nude black woman in an oyster shell, drawn by dolphins through the water and accompanied by cupids, Neptune, and others. Good evening, welcome uh, everybody. This was uh, Naomi Veldwijk, whom I will uh, properly introduce in a minute. First of all, I would really like to uh, welcome you um, to this evening. Um, my name is Patricia Pistus, I'm a director of the Amsterdam School of Cultural Analysis, um, and we've had the honor of collaborating with Wendelin van Oldenborg, with Lucy Kotter, and also with uh, Witte de Wit, uh, Yuri, Natasha, Daphne, uh, to organize this program um, uh, this evening and also on Thursday. We are very uh, honored and happy to be here. And we have um, uh, composed a, a program uh, tonight, which will be guided by three beautiful women. They are all uh, there, whom I will first introduce to you. And then I will also say a little bit about uh, the poem that you just heard, give it a little bit of context. And then we will introduce the film screening, uh, Painted uh, Black by uh, Tessa Boerman. Um, and after the screening and a short Q&A, we will have a, um, a break. And after the break, we resume with another poem, with um, a, a dialogue between uh, Tessa and Valika, uh, and uh, another poem. So that's the, the program uh, for tonight. But let me introduce uh, um, the three, our, our three guides through hidden art histories uh, for uh, tonight. Um, the first uh, speaker you already uh, heard, uh, that is uh, Naomi Veldwijk. Veldwijk. <laughs> um, uh, she's a writer, a poet, and a spoken word art artist who teaches uh, creative writing and theater to youths from 12 to 21 years. Uh, she started writing when she was only eight years old. She moved from children's bedtime stories to song lyrics and now performs on stage with her spoken word poetry. It all began in 2013 when she won a talent show, Violencia. 
A year later, she made it to the finals of another talent show, Fantastics. You can also ask her to write personal poems for your birthday, team building day, or special occasions such as Black Rebels, the program at the International Film Festival in Rotterdam, where she also performed. And currently, Naomi is the house poet of talk show Fresh, where she listens to the guest speakers and performs a piece on the spot. And we asked Naomi to uh, perform um, uh, uh, poems, um, but the last poem will be uh, one of her own, inspired by everything uh, that we are going to talk about uh, tonight. Um, then um, we have Tessa Boerman, um, who is an independent documentary filmmaker. She made films uh, such as A Knockout, um, Puck and uh, The Enigma of the Code, and uh, Painted Black, Swart Belicht, uh, the film that we are seeing uh, tonight. She is also a programmer and a cultural advisor. Her work focuses on issues of representation, diversity and inclusion. And for the International Film Festival Rotterdam, uh, she programmed Black Rebels, where Naomi was one of the performers, um, and which was a program focusing on international films about and predominantly by black people navigating the cultural divide since the origin of cinema. With the Dutch Directors uh, Guild, she advocates for cultural diversity and inclusion in the Dutch film and TV industry. And uh, um, Tessa will very shortly also introduce uh, the film uh, um, that we are going to see. And um, the third speaker, uh, our third uh, guest is uh, Valika Smulders. Um, she um, 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 graduated, has a PhD from the Erasmus University um, in 2012, um, and she specializes in social diversity, heritage uh, museums, and the slavery past. She has written on heritage institutions and the presentation of slavery uh, past in the Netherlands and Curaçao, Suriname, Ghana, and South Africa. As the owner of Passado Presente, she works uh, on new heritage presentations and new audiences. As a researcher for uh, the Royal Netherlands Institute of South e uh, Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies in Leiden, she studies the Dutch Caribbean dias diaspora and new definitions of heritage. And one of the things she does, among others, is uh, give heritage tours, walking through tours through The Hague for now, right? But we will hear much more about uh, all this. Um, so, and he, he, these are the images, they are live here <laughs> very soon. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of context to the poem uh, or, uh, that you just uh, heard, which is a poem um, uh, by Robin Cost Lewis, and it's actually a very conceptual poem uh, that consists of um, references titles of um, uh, uh, film uh, of uh, artworks, um, exhibition catalog texts, um, and uh, descriptions, uh, museum descriptions um, of artworks where a black female figure um, is present. Um, and she had a few rules uh, to, uh, to conceive this, this uh, poem, and I will just very briefly summarize those rules, um, so, um, because I think it's, it's important to, uh, um, you know, to have that uh, as a background. So uh, she calls it a narrative poem that is uh, comprised solely of, um, you know, entirely of titles, catalog entries, and exhibit uh, descriptions of Western uh, objects. Um, so her rules were very simple, she said, no title uh, could be broken or changed in any way. Um, the second rule is that art um, was a very wide concept in the traditional sense, including painting, sculpture, installations, photography, lithographs, engravings, and any work on paper. But while working on this work, she discovered uh, that she actually also had to uh, include all kind of other visual ob objects, such as combs, spoons, buckles, pens, knives, or table legs. And then the third rule is that at some point she realized that a lot of institute had changed uh, the name and titles uh, in their descriptions um, and replaced words like slave, colored, and negro um, um, uh, by African-American. 
and in order to replace this historical erasure of slavery, however well intended, um, she uh, took replaced them back. So, um, and I quote her, I re-corrected the corrected horror to allow that original horror to stand. Um, so these are a few of the, the rules uh, that um, uh, the poem um, uh, uh, consists of. Um, and um, um, I, I will also just, I have just collected some of the images that um, uh, she refers to. The poem, the title of the poem is from this uh, work, uh, The Voyage of the Sable Venus from Angola to the West Indies. Um, there are a lot of uh, Venuses in her work and all kind of different names. This African Venus, um, many portraits from the 19th century. She goes through the centuries uh, from 38,000 uh, uh, BC to now. And here are some more uh, recent uh, references. Um, but um, so far, just this to, uh, to introduce and frame a little bit the, the poem that uh, you will hear, hear another part of uh, later on. Now I would like to... Um, um, uh, oh, here's another one, <laughs> a very important one. Uh, yeah. um, and ask uh, Tessa to, uh, to come here and maybe um, say a few words of introduction uh, to, uh, to the film. Thank you, Patricia. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'll keep it short because I hopefully the film uh, speaks for itself. Um, what I would like to say is a bit about the uh, context of the film because the film was made um, uh, alongside an exhibition that took place about the imagery of uh, blacks through the history of art. And the reason why that was necessary is because there was well, the simplest way to say it was there was a huge blind spot about, and the film will uh, talk about that, um, but there was so much more and there was so much revealed that um, it was quite hard to narrow it down to one documentary, so I had to make a choice. But it was not only on the level of the amounts of works that, represent, that had representations of black figures, but it was all through uh, the whole perception and art history and the science of studying art. So literally from the techniques that were described to, uh, of painting uh, black people to uh, the way that curators conceive their own collections. So it opened up, that research opened up a whole body of uh, new eras. And um, I think that the, one of the things that I found really interesting but also shocking is that a lot of paintings had representations that people couldn't figure out. For instance, there's one painting by um, uh, a man, a black man in uh, 1500, and nobody could match it to any kind of historical context because we have no body of knowledge about black presence in the 15th century in Europe of that class status. Apparently, he was of a very high um, 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 social economical status. So that means that we have collectively erased a history, but also the painters, maybe that's even more important to say, that the painters um, recorded and consolidated, they testified from a history that doesn't match any kind of literature. So it's, I think it's really exciting because we have the opportunity now for the future to, um, to rediscover all those histories. So there's a whole body of knowledge that we are can still uh, dive into. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the film and feel the same uh, excitement that I felt.
the greatest insult is to be ignored, to be in the room but treated as if you simply do not exist. And this is part of what struck me in my research on Dutch art history.
Okay, we have time for a few questions uh, about the film, and, and then after the break we will certainly also have the occasion to return to several other uh, elements. And actually the floor is immediately open for your questions. But maybe in the meantime you could maybe uh, tell us something. Was um, the Black is Beautiful exhibition, was that the occasion to make the film, or, or what, 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 uh, what was the part that led you to making this film? Um, originally, I was asked to uh, do films on the exhibition, so to take particular works of art and um, explore them in films for the audience. But there was so much that I really felt, I, of course, that was nice to do, but I really felt like uh, doing a bigger um, more independent work on the subject, so that's the reason why I made the film. And uh, as a filmmaker, do you see a lot of parallels? Um, of course, you showed some of that also in Black Rebels uh, program in Rotterdam, but um, the history of cinema and the history of art history, do you see parallels uh, there? Or Yeah, I think it's in all aspects of culture. But uh, I think it's in all aspects of um, our history, on every level, um, that we find out how much ideology has influenced uh, the way we look, our whole gaze, uh, the way we interpret, what we see, how we, how we value. And by doing that, um, we have to reevaluate, I think, constantly um, the things that have been made, for instance, with film. Black people have been resisting the imagery of blacks in film, starting from the origin of film. Um, one of the most famous films that um, first films was by uh, W. H. Griffith, called *Birth of a Nation*. Uh, but that was a film where black people were uh, also in, but it hailed and it glorified the Ku Klux Klan, and the black people were portrayed as rapists and uh, dangerous people. So that's how the origin of cinema. Um, came alongside with the creation of a very aggressive, negative, extremely racist imagery of black people. Um, so that's, I think, where we all have been, um, um, we've been intoxicated in some way with that imagery. And what I found interesting about paintings, because these are the oldest, in a way, uh, visual expressions, older than film or any other media, is that you can still can go back to the ar archaeology of that medium and find both, like Jean-Michel Massin says, the archaeology of racism, but also the discovery of a completely different imagery. And with film, there have been a lot of black filmmakers making films that weren't valued as important. So we have to go back through that history as well to dig that up. Yeah. A lot of hidden histories. Yeah. I'm looking at the audience. Is there any? immediate question for Tessa now about the, the, the film. Um, yeah? Yes, hi, yes. from, uh, from oh. me. Um, I would like to ask you this image of the ghost <laughs> <laughs> between the, the painted images. Uh, like, how did you think about this? Uh, so it, it, you, you um, placed the interviewees into the painting as a ghost, as it were, into the world of the painting. I found it quite an intriguing, intriguing image. So I was wondering if you wanted to say a little bit more about your choice doing that. Um, well, the very first problem you have as a filmmaker is that when you make a film about paintings, it's very static. So um, with, with the camera, uh, cinematographer Mella van Essen, uh, which I think is an amazing uh, cinematographer, uh, we're thinking about how we could make the paintings coming alive. But also to do another thing, to, because I really wanted to people to look at a different way at these paintings and to emphasize that, um, that you can go, literally, go into this imagery on another level. So we, had to, we were looking for ways to visualize that, to really feel that you are going into the picture or see a different um, uh, aspect or layer of that picture. And that's the reason why we came up with the idea to really make the pictures transparent and to see both the person watching the picture and the picture itself, because I think the gaze is really important, the way we look at things and how we interpret. So what we finally did, we had to figure out how to do that. So there were a lot of techniques that we discussed, but finally we had 
huge plastic, we had built a studio, we had huge, I'm gonna tell you uh, how things work, a uh, huge big um, a plexi um, 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 frames on which we projected the highest definition of the paintings we could get. So um, they were literally transparent and we had uh, dollies around them so we could move with the camera around the imagery. But we wanted to give it a different feeling uh, to the painting. And so also it was a possibility to blow them up because some paintings are really small or the, um, and it's really hard to get that kind of a connection of the person who's looking and the painting itself. And also because a lot of these um, black figures literally look at us. And that's also another aspect that really surprised me because I was thinking, how can you miss these figures? Because you have this huge painting and right in the middle of the painting, there's one person, a black person, who's literally looking at you. So that's, the gaze was already there. Yeah. Interesting also because of the idea of the ghosts as like, you know, as, as the, the non-seen in society. Yes, so it's yeah, kind yeah. of, I thought maybe it had sort of yeah, a reminiscence the, of that. Yeah. Also the uh, quote of Invisible, the quote in the beginning of the film, um, that was read by um, Alison Blakely, the historian. It's a quote from uh, the book Invisible Man by uh, Rolf Ellison. And that whole book is about a anonymous person, a person with no name who, dis who is invisible because he's not invisible, but people can't see him. So that's also an aspect why I came back to this. Yeah, but I find it in indeed very interesting that you make the interpreters into the ghosts, into the into the painting. It's just a really nice uh, sort of turnaround of the who's, yeah, who's was, the ghost. It was us, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who didn't see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah very good. Very yeah. good. Uh, can I ask another question? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I also thought um, that it's very interesting how it's not very clear sometimes you've chosen people to interview that have different attitudes towards the material, so to say. And I find this very nice and subtle, how that sort of leaves us also to wonder and think about, like, what are these interpretations? You know, how do we value these interpretations? For instance, the, I think the conservatrice or whatever, the, the person who was um, preparing the paintings in... In the uh, Maurits house? In Maurits house, yeah. she obviously has some trouble with, like, her relationship to these actual figures. But it's, it's interesting, I think, how yeah, they both, and I think also the director of the museum in, in Antwerp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So. You can see that people are really struggling with this issue. For instance, this um, conservator in the Mauritz house who's doing the Rembrandt, which I thought, like, wow, you can do redo a Rembrandt, which is quite fascinating. Imagine these people are like the best experts in their field. And they find out that there's been something that they haven't had no knowledge about. So it really puzzles them in a way also. And that confusion to go through all these steps, like you're an expert, you, you lack a certain expertise, you find out something, you wonder why that is, and then you find out there's a whole world behind that. And there's also the whole aspect of racism, of prejudice, of uh, this whole imagery, this whole racial imagery. And I think that's quite painful also. So you, I had a lot of people struggling. I really, those interviews were like so long because people were also fra afraid to do, um, to say things. Uh, they were afraid to, some people wouldn't be interviewed because they all know it's sensitive. But I wanted to give a whole display and a whole mm -hmm. range of opinions and attitudes and feelings you could have towards it. Yes, there, there's a question. No? No. No. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I was wondering about uh, the art hist historians. Um, where are they, y there were no black art historians that you uh, could find, or, or I, I was just wondering about um, the color, the skin color of the art historians. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to out anyone here, but there was a black art historian. And this is really hard. You know, even I know this phenomenon. When you're black and you're working on a black topic, you have a, 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 the risk a white person would never have to be always narrowed down to a black subject. So as a white person, you could do a black subject today and do something completely different tomorrow. But when you're black and you're doing that, you make a very a pinnacle um, a, a decision for your career. 
So there was a black uh, art historian, but he didn't want to be interviewed. Um, and then there's another thing that, um, because the topic is quite sensitive, I think it's still sensitive, and hopefully in the future it be will become less sensitive, um, but the, um, so I wanted to make sure that I would have the, the, the experts, and in this field there are very few black people, uh, of art historians with that kind of um, uh, expertise that are uh, undoubted, like Elizabeth McGrath is like, the undoubted uh, uh, expertise in, uh, on the Rubens. But um, Alison Blakely is one of the few, and luckily enough, there are more people uh, coming. But for this, I really needed the people who did the research on uh, their topic. Yeah. Okay, mm, not another question in the meantime? Just looking, oh, yeah. We should stop, I think, have a little break. <laughs> yeah, it's, if there is no immediate question, we will pick up other questions uh, after the break, but um, we'll have a short break now and then uh, return. Yep, okay, thank you.
a Negro slave woman carrying a cornucopia representing Africa. A Negro slave woman holding a plate of tropical fruits, including a pineapple. A Negro servant boy brings in a tray of filled glasses, winged female figure of hope, leaning on an anchor and holding a wreath over an inscribed monument with a bale of cotton, and a ship in the background. Negro boy holding feathers in his left hand, pointing to hope, and a book under his right arm, and a black man holding a rifle and pointing to the arms of the United States. Above their side is a ballot box, and behind them a locomotive. Abraham Lincoln holding a kneeling black woman by the wrist and lifting her to her feet. Charity holding three children, one white, one red, one black, with a Chinese holding her drapery. Kneeling Negro woman lifting her fettered hands to a female figure personifying justice. Inside a wreath, Negro woman and white woman shaking hands. Negro man and white man, his arm around a small Negro girl, doing the same inside a wreath of sugar cane stems. Negro man and white man, his arm around a small Negro girl, doing the same inside a wreath of sugar cane stems. Okay, <laughs> um, so the dialogue is between you, but I'll I have a few questions. And um, um, the first one is actually um, for you both uh, to um, maybe reflect upon this notion of uh, the blind spot that uh, that was so prominent in uh, in your film, but it's also. Uh, you know, a blind spot in history that you are working with, and and you know how, what is involved in this blind spot? What are you know the pains, the the problems? What are your visions on it? Uh, how can it be solved? <laughs> how can it be put in the light? Uh, it's an open question to both of you, and maybe you also want to you know enter into dialogue <laughs> together. But are you looking at me? Is this working? <laughs> um, well, I think to begin with, it's really important to reflect on the museum and um, in what context the museum came into being. Um, because as we saw in the documentary very clearly, it, were not, it, it was not the, the artists who painted really uh, racist imagery. It was in the context of collecting and uh, the way the, the paintings were described that these descriptions came into being, that this silence came into being. Um, and the museum uh, came about at the end of the colonial era um, and the beginning of uh, nationalism, of, nation, of the nation state. Um, so Europe was looking for a new way of defining itself, a new way of defining its position in the world. It was losing all these huge empires, uh, the West and the East. Um, it had to redefine what Europe was, just Europe, without those big possessions. Um, and in that context, um, these museums came uh, to represent what Europe saw itself as after this colonial period in which slavery was legitimized through racism. Um, and of course, the elite of that period um, was seeking to um, redefine its own position, to hold on to its own position, and at the same time legitimize what had happened in the past, that whole slavery period. 
Um, so I think that is what, what uh, is the first thing that uh, brought these silences into being. I don't know how you look at it. Um, yes, definitely, I, I agree with you fully. And I think on a personal level, it's really hard for people to digest all these information because it's not part of our culture, it's not part of our education to talk about these issues. So they have to go through the po process on the individual level and to come back to the um, poetry that uh, Naomi has read so wonderfully. Thank you, Naomi. Um, the, uh, Robin Costa Lewis, the poet, in the uh, book, she describes a scene, I think it's from 1937, somewhere around that, the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art. It's a small announcement of an employee's um, gathering where they go for a night out altogether and they go to a black minstrel show. So the black faces, you know, uh, the black faces became popular because of the uh, well-known, I mean, because of the Black Pete discussion in the Netherlands. So an institute like the Metropolitan Museum, like an elite art um, institute, museum, and the people who are working there, they go to a minstrel show, a very racist, stereotypical representation of black people. So if that is the reality people are living in, and they make des decisions, and they make policy, they build their collection, um, from that state of mind, it's really hard to change an institute. And I think that is still what's happening today. The people who are making decisions, they themselves have to go through the process of awareness uh, to be able to make different choices. And um, it is happening now, but it goes really slow. It is changing, I think. It, you're very right. In 1937, that's still the epitome of uh, legalized racism and segregation in the United States. I think it was in the 70s that um, in museums there was a uh, broader knowledge of um, or a, um, um, a growing awareness of the silences that had been represented in the past. Um, where people realized that the people who had before that time had been called the people without history had to be represented. So they focused more or a little more on female history, on the history of children, history of labor. So those uh, changes came about. And right now, actually, I think we are at a very exciting uh, moment um, in this uh, history where you see that a further democratization is going on where people are becoming more involved in what is being shown in uh, museums, in what ways it's being shown. There's more of a focus, less on the um, olden days, uh, white male uh, heroes of the past, and more about um, um, individual stories of a diverse uh, population. So it is changing slowly, but we'll have to see whether it sticks or not. Yeah, but I think there's also a counter movement because of that happening. Uh, for instance, both in um, art, I think, as in popular culture, for instance, a film like Michiel de Ruyter, uh, there's, there is also a glorification of that colonial history in different ways. And of course, there's a counter movement who tries to stop that, but it, so it's like, this discussion is really uh, being countered as well, so it's still being challenged. But I think, uh, like I said, there were very few black people art historians working on this field. But there are more historians like you, there are more people, there's a whole population uh, and younger people that really are pushing those boundaries. So I think there's no turning back. And yeah. it's really difficult, of course, if, um, I mean, for example, the lack of black art historians. If in schools you never learn about this history uh, um, in a way that you see yourself represented, people will not be inclined to go and study art history. So if we don't have any art historians that uh, have any affinity with this uh, uh, with representation, um, if there are no, no art historians that are writing the new books, um, it will be very difficult to change. Mm -hmm. 
Vallika, can, can you tell something about your, I've just put up now the website of your uh, uh, Passado Presenza, can you tell us a little bit about what you are doing um, in, in, you know, in countering or, or telling, you know, uncovering hidden stories and um, making us more conscious about the richness and the multiplicities of the past? Yeah, I, um, I live in The Hague for a long time now, about 25 years. And I've always been working on uh, diversity and museums and slavery past, heritage, uh, representation. But I've always done that everywhere but in my own, uh, in, the, in the city I live. So when I finished my thesis, um, which was about uh, Africa and the Caribbean and how they handle their slavery past, um, I was looking around for a new challenge. And I realized that the challenge was right on my front doorstep. Um, so um, I had the opportunity to do research for the, the Hague Historical Museum into the Hague slavery past, which was really underrepresented. And um, uh, from there, I started doing tours through the Hague um, uh, by boat, uh, walking tours um, by bus as well. Um, to shine light on those sides of the history that, of The Hague that we never get to see. And The Hague was, of course, the center of uh, uh, the Dutch kingdom. So from The Hague, uh, the whole kingdom was um, administrated. People were sent out as administrators to uh, the Caribbean, for example. When they were there, they acquired uh, possessions which included human beings. And when they came back, those uh, plantations and the enslaved people that went with it, they um, were handed uh, over from generation to generation. So there were generations of people in The Hague that were slave owners without ever having met those people in the Caribbean themselves. But through those connections, of course, also people who had been enslaved themselves came to uh, The Hague. So in The Hague, you can tell the stories of uh, the colonial period through very different um, histories. And what I keep discovering is that there were, uh, as was said in the documentary actually, that there were a lot more uh, black people present in the Netherlands than we often take for granted. Um, and it is true, what uh, Esther Schroeder said in the documentary, they were here all along, but it opens up a complete new set of questions. What, was, um, what did our society back then look like? What were the circumstances these people lived in? How did they deal with that? Um, so we need to do a lot more research into that to get to uh, discover a little bit more, to get a, a better view of what was happening, what was going on. Yes, if we now next uh, week or tomorrow go to The Hague, what is a place where we, you know, should stand still and uh, think of something that you are going to tell us now? <laughs> there are so many. Just, you know, just one. <laughs> okay, well, let's start with the Mauritz House. I think everybody's familiar with the Mauritz House and how complex that, that um, history is. Um, but it is also a, a, a great breaking point because uh, Johan Maurits van nassau Sieger was the first uh, Dutch person who um, conquered both part of the Americas and of uh, Africa. So that was the first time when the Netherlands became uh, involved in the slave trade at a nation level. Um, so you could see that, 1637, that uh, year as the, the beginning of uh, slavery for the Netherlands. Uh, Johan Maurits van der Sieger, um, he, uh, um, he collected art history. Um, so it was the first collection that was about uh, that colonial period and the slavery history. But everything that we see before that, and I think that was not really clearly mentioned in the documentary, the pre-colonial era, everything we see in there is um, in a, you should see in a much different context, because that was the context in which the Moorish Empire was big in Europe. Um, 
Spain was dominated by the Moors for 700 years. So back then, um, the hierarchy that came into being in the colonial era did not exist yet. Um, and of course, there are great gray eras, um, but I think it's important to distinguish between the pre-colonial era, the colonial, and the post-colonial. Um, if you look at art and uh, you want to understand what, uh, in what context that art was made. Yeah, so, so really important to go back to far away in, in history. But uh, Tessa, for you, uh, I mean, the Black Rebels program that you did in uh, Rotterdam was uh, very you know, successful and, and, and uh, very important. And um, talking about the future now then, uh, can you tell us something about um, what you as a programmer uh, for Rotterdam um, are uh, doing now, how you want to, um, what are your plans to, um, to continue um, uh, to shed light on uh, this, you know, blind spot uh, that... Um, there is so much work to do. <laughs> Let's start off with that, because there is so much that needs to be done. But what I think is really interesting about this time, particularly this time, is that everyone feels the urgency to fight for values that are really important to everyone. So I think if there's a time in recent history where there is room to address these issues, it's now. Because everyone feels that there's so much at stake the, on, a, um, on a global level. Um, when it comes to um, the presence or the representation of black people in, um, not only in the Netherlands, but in the uh, Western world, so to say, or maybe even globally, because I'm going to focus on Africa also, is that to me it's like a, it's like a treasure box because there's so much that uh, could be addressed, and one of the things that I'm really interested in is that um, the whole emancipation movement that is also happening now in the Netherlands and worldwide started off with the po in the colonial era. Uh, with the slave resisting uh, resistance, people are always resisting suppression, and by doing that, they had to develop a um, a discourse that would inclu be inclusive to all those people in the African diaspora, all the black people around the world, that would include that same struggle, and you can find that in Pan Africanism, and I'm so excited about that because. The whole ideology of Pan-Africanism was that the whole of the African continent was colonized, so people really needed a common agenda. And by doing that, they had to look for um, a political discourse, but also a cultural discourse, to tackle all those um, uh, issues impregnated on people of African descent by um, the colonization and by the racist imagery and by the a subversion of um, black people and black culture. And to counter that, there was a whole new movement. I cannot talk about everything right now, but that's what I would love to do. And it's also very much linked to cinema. There have been a lot of films made about that. It was global, going from W.E.B. Du Bois in the United States to uh, Kwame Krumah and uh, Lumumba and um, uh, uh, Frans Fanon. Uh, so people around the globe who are working on that Pan-African project. And I think that is really relevant now because people are picking that up again and it goes right against any form of nationalism and uh, focusing only on uh, your own interests, but really to look for global issues and for continental issues and uh, to be inclusive. Great, and you're going to do a lot of research still to, yes, to bring back to, huge, uh, to territory. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, there is another issue that I think uh, is important uh, to, to discuss uh, in, in this context, and that is, of course, the much debated <laughs> and always returning question of identity. Mm -hmm. um, is it a good concept at all? <laughs> um, um, what um, does it mean uh, to rethink our histories um, for concepts of uh, identity? And I would love to have both your views on that. And um, I think you also brought some images uh, to talk about that. But um, so what do we do with identity? <laughs> yeah. I think for a lot of people, it's very tempting to talk about identity as a fixed 
uh, definition, I think is very dangerous, and it's also um, um, it's a, a restriction of, I think, reality, but also a restriction of self. Nevertheless, um, you, I think people do identify. Maybe it's a more dynamic uh, process, and identity sounds like a very solid uh, concept. But I, um, to emphasize the fluidity of identity, I think it's better to talk about identification or where you identify with. And um, I think the uh, the redefinition of these histories, of these identities as they've been defined uh, in a colonial context, is really important because people do identify with those concepts of for instance, with uh, ideas of Dutchness, or um, um, the whole language is also part of that uh, process of identification. And I think for everyone, it's really important to open that whole discourse up. To uh, uh, And also, I think it, it really pays, in a sense, to reality, because even um, when we could go back to our ancestors, probably n there are very few people who, are, who have a mono-ethnic background. So it's we're all part of that same uh, diversity. So it's all our history, um, and I think there's also a necessity to really challenge the whole idea of identity because now you have all these forces that really try to consolidate a very fixed idea of identity that's very restricted and close. It's mainly um, to exclude other people. So I think it's in the interest of us all to really um, define identity in a very uh, fluid way. Maybe we can um, go to some examples with the imagery. Yeah. Um, this is a painting that's part of the collection of the, ha the, the Hague Historical Museum. Uh, it's a very small painting. This is uh, an, um, a detail of it. So you get a clear view of the two black servants over there. Do you see them? This is um, Willem de Vijfde, Willem V, the Stadthouder, with his family. Um, and these two black servants, one is, uh, was born in Curaçao and the other one was born in Africa. And the, the Hague Historical Museum is doing an exhibition on these two servants, in, uh, which will open in September, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, for me, the interesting thing is the realization that one of these men was from Curaçao, and the painting is from 1781, so um, it goes against that whole image people have of uh, people from the Caribbean migrating since the 20th century, becoming part of this uh, society only since the 20th century. And we know of one of these men that he was married, had children. Um, so he probably has, or it is very uh, likely that he has um, descendants who live in the Netherlands right now, and they probably are very white. Well, if you look at the painting, the people that will feel affinity, a connection to these men, are probably darker-skinned people. So that whole identification thing is... Um, <laughs> you can turn that on its head uh, through this. I know that um, for the KITLV, um, um, the, the Koninklijke Institute of Talent and Volkenkunde, which I work for, I'm looking at the way that heritage is defined right now within the kingdom. Um, so one of the things I'm curious about is whether this exhibition will trigger people to look at their own identity in a different way, whether Dutch people will get to realize that um, Curaçao people have been part of uh, the Dutch kingdom for a long time, whether Curaçao people will feel the recognition that they have been part of Dutch identity and uh, heritage for a long time. But we'll have to see uh, about that. Do you want to go to the next uh, image? Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> this is an example of uh, somebody that we do know for sure that he has uh, descendants right now in uh, The Hague. 
This is Gerardus Congolowango, who was the grandson of a man who came to the Netherlands from Africa in the 1820s. Um, and um, when I did my research for the, the Hague Historical Museum, uh, we made a map of um, 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 the Hague, um, which represented or was presented by the Wethouder, the um, Alderman, thank you, to um, the descendant of this, uh, this man you see over here. So we could show that the legacy of slavery is still very much alive in uh, present day uh, people nowadays. But the thing is, the interesting thing, this family got a surname, Kongolowango, which represents um, African identity. But we know that there are other families who have surnames in which you can't recognize this African heritage. So those families are not aware that they are descendants of these servants who came to the Netherlands in uh, the colonial period. But um, I would be really curious if we would do a DNA test on all of the Netherlands. What percentage of Dutch people are really uh, descendants of African people without knowing it? Well, um, according to the painting um, um, uh, of uh, Rubens, we are all, you know, <laughs> descendants of. Um, the an African the woman, the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, and and not only in this painting. I mean, it's also in, in uh, biology and genetics yeah. that's really actually, um, yeah, known and established. But uh, that and that's all very important to realize. But um, you you just mentioned it already. There are counter movements, and and uh, um, so I is there a way <laughs> how um, how to address the counter movements? That that's uh, because there is a fear also of uh, losing your identity, of losing, um, you know, the British identity or Dutch mm -hmm. or uh, whatever it may be. I mean, it's not a fixed. Co but um, um, and I think I fear that yes, proposing other kinds of concepts that are more fluid might not be enough. So I'm I'm uh, at, me, at least not for. Uh, a lot of counter forces. I have no answer. It's really a huge, big question. But I was wondering if you have any views on on that. I think we really have to hurry up. There is no time to waste to uh, change the curriculum of education to really do that to make it inclusive. Um, and I think with all the institutes that work on the field of culture, education, politics. We have to diversify because if we don't, we exclude and estrange a huge amount of people, and it will estrange us all. So, um, and I think it's also necessary for the uh, for the culture and society as a whole to not to be fragmented. You know how strong the forces are to divide people. Uh, sorry, to divide people along lines of identity or culture, race, religion. It's very tempting because of all the things that are happening. Fear is really easy to ignite. But there's an interest for us all, I think, to not be fragmented, to, to make everyone be represented. But the process is so hard. Like I think everyone who works in an institution or an organization, change is really hard. And there's no way that things are going to change if you don't take really radical and drastic um, um, solutions. So you really have to diversify. And you know what really shocks me in a way is that how everybody knows about the bubble and the filters. And but when you look at individual peoples, and I'm not saying this to condemn anyone, but if you look at individual lives of people, I come to birthday parties so often, where people, first of all, I'm the only black person in the room, or the only person of color, or the only, you know, there's a v most people have very homogeneous. Uh, environments and for that to take it to another level if you think about changing and diversifying people have no references how to do that because they hadn't had any practice in their own lives to deal with these issues and to talk about these issues in a very relaxed or uh, like natural way so we have to learn this and I think we, there's no time to waste to do that because we have to 
address these issues as soon as we can on a global level. And also to keep it addressed, right? Because very yes. often we've yeah. had all these waves every yeah. 10 or 20 years. There is a wave yeah, it's of like a carousel, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and then it, it all disappears again yeah. and we forget collectively or, or we, you know, political circumstances change. But, you know, to make sustainable and yes. long-term changes, that is probably uh, the challenge. Um, and to put it, to keep it on the agenda, and I think change from within is really important. So people uh, like you and me who have, who are working within their own profession to change things, because we know exactly within our field of work how things can be changed from within. But from the outside, like the citizens, audiences, people who are really mad, that's also important because they push from the outside and make sure it's on the agenda. So I think every kind of struggle, any kind of um, way to address things is important to keep it on the agenda. Well, in order to um, put uh, all this also in an interactive way <laughs> with the audience, <laughs> Uh, and to put um, um, some historical knowledge, uh, a new different historical knowledge uh, um, with you, um, we um, made some um, questions, or actually you. <laughs> I think it's time to do our uh, history quiz. <laughs> for this. And uh, yes, and uh, is there a prize, Tessa? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I hope you're going to like it, though. I, I took... I took an, um, it's almost a, a medium that's almost about to die. It's a DVD. Yeah. So maybe it might be the last <laughs> DVD ever. Uh, it's a DVD of my film. So there is a prize to win. But uh, I'm, uh, I don't know, somebody has to keep uh, <laughs> the winner, the score. <laughs> Who can keep the score? We cannot see it. Maybe we should have a bit more light uh, in the audience. I don't know. I will count the, the you will count? Okay, great. Shall we then um, go to our first uh, question? When Tessa is back. <laughs> oh, maybe you can already. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think quite a few of you will be familiar with this picture. Um, who would this boy be? Where did he live? Any idea? And if you think about where he would live, what does that mean about his nationality? Not everybody at once. Just take a <laughs> way. <laughs> take a wild guess. Raise your hands when you know. <laughs> well, let's start with the lady then. Any of you familiar with the lady on the picture, on the painting? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> well, the English connection. She was born in England, yes. She's uh, Mary Stuart the first. Does that help? Mary Stuart I was connected to Johann Mauritz von Nassau Sieghoff, the Mauritz House, which is how this painting came about. And still, if anybody wants to win the DVD, then somebody oh, should yeah. raise his hand Make before something. I start talking. 147 countries in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're getting oh, there. The Thank you. Okay. <laughs> 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 One point for you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, in any idea where this boy might have lived? Where in the Netherlands? The Hague. Of course, yes. <laughs> Two points. So, where did Mary Stuart <laughs> live? In the Maurits house. Huh? <laughs> almost, almost. That's where your Maurits van Nassau Siege lived. <laughs> she lived on the Binnenhof. There's still the Mary Stuart cabinet that's been kept there, I hear. I've never visited it. I'm very curious. But maybe this boy lived there. So maybe he lived in the heart of the Netherlands, making him very, very Dutch, of course. And maybe he married and had children, and maybe his descendants are still among us. But the funny thing, we know nothing about him because he's not being, you know, he's in no description. He has no name. Um, 
Let's hope somebody finds out later on. I'm just curious what nationality was then, though. I mean, well, uh, that the whole notion of nationality mm -hmm. in 1664 was not easy to connect with in terms of this painting and the relationship. Of so, course, yes. So that is nationality again, only a, came about in the 19th century. Yeah. I asked this to trigger thinking yeah. of where did he live and what does that make him? Because if you say he lived in The Hague, people still tend to think, okay, so maybe he was visiting or maybe... And, and so many people talk about these servants on paintings like they were symbols, that they were never really part of the Netherlands. And I think research will show that they were very much part of the Netherlands. So he should be part of Dutch identity since then. Certainly, but the word nationality is, um, for me, it's very, it's very tricky because it sort of denies like the relationship depicted in, in the painting as well. And it feels a bit like one of the um, art historians said, like we're, we're, we're viewing it now with, with our eyes from mm -hmm. now, the context was very different then. So nationality sort of triggers that confusion, I would say, that word. Probably he didn't have a nationality, but he was in the inventory of uh, their possession. Yeah, that's even sadder. Yeah. Can I respond to that particular? I'll wait for the microphone. Yeah. I mean, paintings like these and from this time have so often been used to d define nationality. As you said, these museums started when nationality was and nationalism were very important. So. I think in that sense it is important to re-look at pictures like this with contemporary eyes as well, and in a different way. We go to question number two. <laughs> when did the first black woman file a lawsuit against the Dutch state for unequal treatment? <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to enter oh. because you've been on my tour. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Exactly. Yes. And can you tell us a little bit more about the story? I know that uh, she was from Suriname and she wanted to marry a, a Dutch man. And it was prohibited by the Dutch government by that time. I'm sorry? Three people were white, but there was no law that uh, said that uh, you couldn't marry anybody of uh, another skin color. So she was allowed to marry a white guy. And so she was the first to challenge this and to, um, well, to be held. Um, uh, she was right. One point for you. Can, can okay. you tell me your name? So this, sorry, Myrna. Myrna. Yeah. Myrna, one okay. point for you. One point for Wendelin, one for Myrna. No, Wendelin has no, two. Okay, two for each. Okay. <laughs> I think the next uh, uh, question is now very easy. <laughs> we should have done. Oh no, no, no. This one is another one. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, actually, if we could just go back to the last picture, the, there's an interesting uh, thing to um, talk about here as oh well. Yeah. If we look at all those images in the documentary, they are all biblical figures or servants or uh, mythological figures um, and some diplomats, of course, of the Moorish era. Um, but actually, there's a lot probably that we don't see. People like Elizabeth Samson were never portrayed. Mm -hmm. So this is a modern painting of Elizabeth Samson, but we have no original authentic painting of her. So you could ask yourself how many women like Elizabeth Samson, or maybe women who were brought to the Netherlands by uh, the elite here, uh, lived here and were never portrayed. Mm -hmm. And I, I just read another detail about this painting. Mm -hmm. um, she wears a, um, a blonde wig, mm -hmm. and that apparently was also part of uh, her, uh, the, uh, the, her story, where she went to a party with a, wearing a blonde wig, but of course she was still not uh, accepted, and that's what I read that uh, inspired this uh, contemporary artist to 
portrayal with a blonde uh, blonde wig uh, here. <laughs> okay, next question. When did the Netherlands have their first black minister? No, mi <laughs> <laughs> anybody else, anybody else? <laughs> Okay, this is the secret. You have to go to Valika's tours, then you get all the information. She knows all the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good um, uh, Ministry as in government. As in government. Yes. And if nobody else knows okay, the Mirna. answer, Mirna, go yes. ahead, <laughs> take the prize. <laughs> I think it's 1911. I don't know for sure. I think almost, it's almost. I think it's 1911. A little earlier. Not earlier than 1907. Yes, even <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Not much earlier, though. It was <laughs> at the start earlier. of the ninth. Yeah. The yes. Okay, let's get his picture. one, but not earlier. I'm sure. 1903. You were almost there. And um, I added this picture of his parents to show that he really was black, although you can't really tell if you look at his picture. But both his parents, which you see in, the, in this picture, um, both of their mothers were enslaved women. Uh, one born in um, Curaçao, probably, and who went to Africa with Governor van der Veer. They had um, his father together. And uh, the lady, his mother, was a descendant of a Jewish man from Amsterdam who lived in Suriname and who, with uh, an enslaved woman who worked for him, had five children. So these people became the first of a um, new Surinamese middle class who um, were freed and who um, were to become li like a buffer between the big group of enslaved people and the elite in, in, Surin in Suriname, because the elite knew that um, emancipation had to come, abolition had to come, and it felt safer for them to build in this new layer of people between the big group of enslaved people that would be freed afterwards and the small group of uh, the elite um, at the top. So they moved to the Netherlands in 1846. Um, and Abraham George Ellis uh, went to Navy school here. And um, he became a Navy officer, had a very interesting career. And almost at the end of his career, he was appointed uh, Minister of Navy. And he worked in The Hague um, at the Ministry of Navy there. So we already had a minister, uh, a black minister, a long time ago. Well, most people would probably think that we never had one mm -hmm. till this date. It's about time that we're going to do it again. That we yeah. have another one. Yeah. <laughs> a darker one yeah. this time. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, actually, um, uh, when he was not a minister anymore, he became a special, a special adjutant to uh, Queen Wilhelmina. So he rose to even higher ranks than that. Next question is probably easier now. <laughs> when did the first interracial marriage take place in the Netherlands? <laughs> Somebody shouting? Yeah. Somebody did shouting? I, hear I, I see a your hand. Seventeen sixty-four. Yes, when this was Samson one of the first, but it wasn't the first, ah, there was one before. to my knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we did see a picture already. Um, there's a clue in there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, the first one I know of is 1745, which was the year that uh, Jacob uh, Kapitein married a Dutch woman. And Jacob Kapitein was the first uh, religious minister um, from Africa to uh, become a minister in the Netherlands. Um, but Cupido, one of these uh, servants of uh, Willem V, 
um, he married shortly afterwards. And yes, Elizabeth Samson married shortly afterwards as well. And you know Rabo married around the same time. But Cupido had children. Yes, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So mm -hmm. there's been a lot more marriages than you would think already halfway through the 18th century. Okay. And I guess that these questions are so that th none of us know the answers, because I didn't know the answers five years ag uh, ago either. It says there's so much more to be discovered about Dutch national history and about uh, identity than we mm -hmm. realize on a regular basis. Last question. Did everyone hear that? Mm. I wondered yeah. the history of marriage. Yeah, yeah. I don't know much about that, the history of marriage. Um, I, no, I really wouldn't know. Any historians in the room that would know? No, I guess there's a difference between uh, getting married before the church or uh, mm -hmm. on a, yeah. Already, already in the Bible there are marriages. So. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. quite yeah. old institutes as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we come to our last question. Mm -hmm. Tessa, do you want to? What was the name of the enslaved Surinese man, Surinamese man whose letter to his family was found recently? No one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> there we have a winner. We have a winner. We have a clear winner. <laughs> I think um, there's an article. There was an article last week in uh, some Dutch papers, mm. and his last name is Charles. Yes, I think it was a letter to wow. Charles. <laughs> <laughs> you won fair and square. With flying colors, you have won. <laughs> yeah. So we have time for one or two more questions, if there are any um, from the audience uh, now. Um, yeah, it's just been recently uh, found out, and um, it's quite sad. When I think there, are, in the coming time, probably there will be more of these documents coming up. But this is quite extraordinary because he writes a letter uh, where he tells about the separation of his parents, that he was separated from his parents, and he's wondering how his parents are doing. They're very far away. I think there are another two letters that were found um, that were written by his aunt. And to find these personal, individual testaments from slaves, it's quite extraordinary. Although I have to say it's not from the hand of this Gideon Charles. Uh, that's what they say, because they say that he couldn't write. But to talk about these other guys that we saw, um, Cupido and Sidorum, one of them could write excellently. They have beautiful handwritings. Uh, there will be a book about uh, these boys that's coming up. But um, I think it's quite extraordinary because it's the first hand testimony of the experience of enslaved people. And I think more research will come up. Yeah, it was just indeed in the newspaper last week that also a lot of the slave um, archives and uh, all the documentation is now being digitized, which will, talking about identity again, make it much easier for many people to search in the archives uh, and to find, you know, hidden stories, hidden family members, hidden, um, hin hidden dimensions of, of their own um, background and uh, identity. So that's We'll probably indeed we'll hear more about that soon. It's all being digitized now as we speak, uh, I think. So any, any questions left uh, in the audience? Because we are nearing um, the end, but if there is, yeah, 
Yeah. Since you made it so open, I, I have a question of literacy in terms of the history, Dutch black history. Is, is, is there a tracing of literacy? Um, so I'm, 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 I'm thinking of the slave history in the United States where there was a certain community who were actually accountants. You know, they were not necessarily working in plantations or it's, it's, it's a curiosity question in the spirit of the television show. If you knew, how would that play into, you know, it's, it's not only being models for paintings, but also literacy, how it may be played into the knowledge systems that are yet to be uncovered. Um, I think we know far too little about that yet, um, but the picture I showed of um, Gerardus Congolobango, we know of his grandfather, that he was literate, um, and that that was um, quite something. Um, we know that he was married two times, and the second time he wanted to get married, he needed a kind of an approval, um, a proof that he was a good citizen, so he needed seven people to sign this form. And those seven people were not all of them literate, but he was because he could sign with his name. Um, while he was uh, a servant and he remained a servant all his life and all his children and grandchildren all remained part of the, um, the lower social classes, it was, yeah, he was literate at the same time. But in the colonies, uh, whether people were literate there, I would doubt it. Probably uh, they were kept illiterate because of, well, subversive, uh, yeah. yes, subversive elements. Yeah. Okay. Probably a lot yeah. will be um, um, discovered because it's all a matter of what do you think is interesting. Because in a lot of interest inventories or archives, there's a huge amount of material and for people to be interested whether there is information from people that were enslaved, it has just recently became, become uh, interesting to look for. Mm. So many more talks that we can have uh, in, the, in the future. Um, I would like to thank you very much. Um, we still have one um, um, important uh, cl closing element uh, for uh, this evening, uh, but I... I um, and that will be really the final word. So I, I just say now thank you to all. Thank you to you uh, very much. And also invite you to uh, uh, our Thursday evening uh, program when we will uh, talk about the work of uh, Edgar Cairo, uh, another um, you know, uh, black poet artist whose paintings also are um, on the black wall behind you um, and who is another um, uh, figure and voice that we want to... Uh, um, you know, remember <laughs> um, and bring back uh, into our consciousness or get to know him if for many like me didn't know him yet. Uh, but that will be for Thursday. So for now, thank you very much. And I'll ask uh, Naomi to, uh, to come and um, uh, have the final words for this, uh, this evening. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Um, I wrote a poem um, as a reaction, a personal reaction to uh, the film. Um, I saw the film and I actually was a little bit angry because I felt like, why did nobody ever tell me this? Um, I've been to school and everything and I was like, why? And why is it so hard to... Um, to have this in our education system. So that's what this is about. <laughs> Negro woman standing on stage, feeling the irony of place she's at, a history well hidden. Negro woman very much aware of why she's here. Negro woman lips are moving. Negro woman being looked at. Does she speak? 
maybe, maybe Negro woman sings. Because that's what they all used to do, right? It's been too hard living. I'm afraid to die. Because I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. My eyes are empty, as if I can't see, as if I'm not able to see like they couldn't or didn't see. Even though my eyes are opened wide, my thoughts, my mind, still I am blinded by the silence of facts that were theirs, needed to be told and shared. But instead, we're buried, instead we're buried before history was something we wanted to know of, before history was something we wanted to learn from, before history had reached us. It was in the hands of those who wanted to silence us. And they succeeded because there are many like me who think they are a salmon in the system, who thought the truth had been taught to them, found out the truth was more complex, and then found their own truth again, thinking that they now must know almost everything, then realize that the whole truth and nothing but the truth is still out there. They succeeded while I thought I was thinking for myself. I need to think again. Can somebody tell me why it's so hard to accept a history we haven't lived? A history we cannot change? A history we didn't even make? What is so strange about our ancestors having ancestors who were kings and queens instead of slaves? Why is it so hard to learn from past mistakes none of the now living even made? We are still playing a game that was said to be over. And you will only acknowledge this if you dare to look closer. We are still playing a game that was said to be over. And you will only acknowledge this if you dare to look closer. I feel left out and lied to because my skin wasn't in the history books I had to remember the stories from. I didn't like history. It should have been their story, then my story wouldn't have been a lie. I feel left out and lied to, neglected and ignored. Negro woman feeling left out and lied to. Negro woman feeling ignored and neglected. Negro woman standing on a stage. Negro woman being looked at. Negro woman lips are moving. Does she speak? Maybe Negro woman sings because that's what they all used to do, right? Can they hear Negro woman? Can they hear her sing? It's been a long, long time coming. But I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Thank you.